Our next speaker is an international correspondent for The New American, which is a John Burke Society publication. And he's also a contributor to WND and other publications. He is an author, economics teacher, and researcher on globalization, sustainability, and global education. He co-authored Crimes of the Educators along with the late Samuel Blums Blumensfeld, a book endorsed by Ron Paul, Phyllis Shafley, and other conservative giants. He has attended global conferences worldwide, including the Rio Earth Summit 2000, the Paris 2015 UN Climate Change Conference, Bilderberg, and others, where he, was, he has witnessed firsthand the statements of the global planners themselves. He has, also ex he has also experienced firsthand the silencing of First Amendment rights. He has been on numerous radio and TV shows as guest commentator. Please welcome and give a great warm welcome to another Bear Witness Central Director, Alex Newman. All right, hey guys, let's see, does the mic work? It sounds like it does. So, very good. Um, I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of stuff really quickly. For some of you, it's probably gonna be like trying to drink out of a fire hose. It's a lot of information really quick, but there's just so much I wanna talk about and so little time to do it. And so I'm gonna to try to cover as much as I can, whatever we, want, we don't get to. Uh, you can always check on YouTube or you know, whatever, and you'll find a lot of this information as well. Uh, so, there is a war on America, there's a war on the American people, there's a war on our children and uh, on mankind, and there's even a war on God, actually. I, I know that sounds totally ridiculous, uh, but you know, the devil is pretty ridiculous. So um, I'm gonna talk about the war on America specifically, and uh, some of the elements of it that I will touch, and I'm not gonna hit all of these, but the dumbed down education, uh, I've got Crimes of the Educators in the back, kind of a full length expose of what's been happening with the government school system and how this happened. Uh, the climate hoax, you know, the global warming that our carbon emissions, you know, the, the gas that we exhale is somehow killing us and we need to give the UN uh, the power to tax and regulate it. Um, the refugee crisis, regionalization, uh, the corrupt, so I won't be hitting a lot of these, but I'll hit as much as I can. Um, this is the book, Crimes of the Educators. If you want a copy, I have some in the back. Um, and what we argue is that the education establishment uh, not your everyday teacher. I'm a teacher and I know tons of really, really good teachers. I know there's actually one in this room. But the education establishment has really become a criminal enterprise. Um, and I realize that sounds kind of like, whoa, really? Criminal enterprise? That's a strong word. But uh, I, I think the book makes a, a solid case that this is the case. And uh, we use mostly primary source documents so you can hear it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, so some of the crimes that we argue are being committed are treason. Uh, we say that the deliberate dumbing down of our nation for the purpose of overthrowing our system of government is treasonous. And um, child abuse, uh, the people who designed parts of this system and some of what's going on did it deliberately to dumb down the children. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't that we just woke up one morning and realized, oops, we wasted a trillion dollars dumbing ourselves down. This was a deliberate plan. Um, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. If you look at some of the pornographic uh, so-called sex education that happens in the classroom, you would be appalled that you have UNESCO promoting this stuff for four-year-olds, stuff that I won't even mention. It's unbelievable. Um, destroying belief in biblical religion. So, you know, they, they pretend like the schools are neutral or that they're secular. Uh, they're nothing of the sort. They're actually deliberately undermining children's faith. And there's been studies done, you know, kids are born with this natural understanding that God created them, that God is good, that God knows everything. This is just natural. It doesn't matter if you're a kid in India or Africa or America or China. All kids are born with this understanding, and it takes deliberate, systematic effort to remove that from them. And that's what's happening in the schools. Uh, they promote atheism, nihilism, humanism, Satanism, evolutionism, all kinds of other crazy things. And uh, drug pushing, right? So they mess up the kids, and then they say, oh, we have a solution for you. How about lots of amphetamines and other powerful mind-altering drugs for you? And then fraud and extortion. Uh, you know, if a businessman came to you and said he's going to sell you a product that did something, and then the product did the opposite, you would consider yourself a victim of fraud, right? That you've been defrauded. And so you would take that person to court, and you would say, hey, they told me it was going to do this. It did the opposite. I want my money back. I want some sanctions here. And that's what's happening with the schools. Uh, so we, we talk about treason, and people think, well, that's a really strong word. 
but here's what Ronald Reagan's commission said in 1983, and you know, it's gotten a lot worse since then. But he put together this commission and they said that if an unfriendly foreign power had imposed this educational system on us, we may have considered it an act of war. So why is it not an act of war if uh, you know, domestic powers or domestic individuals impose the system on us? Uh, I would say that it still is an act of war. And as you'll see through this presentation, the purpose actually uh, was to subvert the foundations and the governing system of the United States. Uh, they also said that the educational foundations of our society are being eroded by a rising tide of meteorocracy, and it threatens our future as a nation and as a people. So that's really strong language, especially from a bureaucratic commission. Our future as a nation is threatened by this education system. And this is according to the government that runs the education system. So what's going on here? Um, and how did we get here? Well, it wasn't always this way, obviously, right? Um, Americans 200 years ago, for the most part, were extremely well educated. If you look at the founders of the United States, just unbelievable. I mean, they could speak Latin and Greek, and they knew the Bible inside and out, and they knew the history of political thought and science. They knew so much. You know, today you can ask people, you know, pretty much any question about history, science, and what? What are you talking about? A lot of them can't even read, as we'll see. Uh, Thomas Jefferson used to brag that American farmers were the only ones who knew Homer, who read Homer. And, you know, ask somebody today from the government schools, who is Homer? And they'll say, oh, yeah, Homer Simpson. Yeah, of course, right? Um, and, and so why were Americans so well educated? Because they needed to know the Bible, right? The very first educational law in what later became the United States was in 1647 in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the Old Deluder Satan Act. And they said, everybody needs to know how to read because they need to know scripture, because if they don't know scripture, then the devil will come around here and he'll get up to no good and he'll trick people. And, uh, you know, we see that today, right? People don't know anything about scripture, so they're very easily misled. So that's why we even had schools in the first place, because kids needed to read so that they could know scripture. That's why we had education to begin with. And this is the very first law. And then consider today, right? That was back when, uh, you know, almost all Americans could read, all free Americans. Uh, today, in 1993, we had a federal literacy study. They said 55% of Americans can barely read, right? They had five categories, five being a good reader, one being not able to read at all, two being, uh, you know, pretty much functionally illiterate. 55% uh, of Americans were in the bottom two categories. So is, is, is this some kind of national accident? Did we just get really stupid one day and forget how to teach people how to read? Well, no, right? Uh, Two-thirds of residents of Washington, D.C. over the age of 15 are functionally illiterate, and that's according to a state education agency report. So, you know, how can this possibly be that we have gotten so dumbed down? Well, uh, Horace Mann really helped kick it all off. Uh, and, you know, whether his intentions were good or bad, I don't know, you know, but what he did do was he went over to Prussia, and they had this authoritarian model where you segregate children by age, and that uh, you teach them obedience to the state in everything, statism, right, in a nutshell, this kind of worship of the state. And the, the Prussian dictatorship was, uh, you know, very effective in indoctrinating the children. And so Horace Mann went over and they said, well, that's great, let's bring that to America, right, we'll, we'll have that kind of system here. And that is actually the genesis of what today is called the American public school system, uh, is, is kind of this knockoff of the Prussian totalitarian education regime. Uh, and uh, Horace Mann, he said he thought it was going to equalize people, and you know, he, he said he had good intentions. Uh, he wanted to get sectarianism out of the schools, because you know, you had a, if you had a Presbyterian town, they would teach Presbyterian doctrines, and if you had, uh, you know, some other kind of doctrine in some other town, they would teach that in the schools. He wanted to get rid of that so that, uh, you know, everybody would kind of think the same, kind of along the Prussian line. Then, um, this Mann was actually one of the earliest proponents of this, and that's why I put it here in the presentation. If you get anything out of this presentation, please remember this. Uh, this is how we got this literacy disaster that we're dealing with right now. This is why so many Americans cannot read. So there's this, you know, for time immemorial, we have a, a phonetic alphabet, right? We have uh, letters, and each letter is associated with one or more sounds. So the A makes an uh sound, the L makes a loo sound, and, you know, you teach kids those things. And then they learn how to read. They learn how to combine these different letters together and what kind of sounds they'll make. And this ends up teaching children how to read. Well, back in the 1800s, Horace Mann, he was actually the first uh, education secretary we had. He was the Secretary of Education for Massachusetts, for the state of Massachusetts. Um, and he pushed this new method of reading. It actually was invented by a guy who seems to have had the best of intentions. He was a reverend. He was taking care of deaf children who couldn't learn how to read the phonetic way because, of course, they, didn't, uh, they couldn't hear phonics, right? So he 
put together this new system of reading where you would get the kids to memorize the words. And if you look at this graphic here, I think it shows you kind of what we're talking about. So you look at a picture of a fish, you look at the writing of the word fish, and then they tell the kids, memorize that this series of squiggly lines spells fish. Or look at the fork, and then you look at the squiggly lines and you say, memorize that these squiggly lines spell fork. And of course that sounds ridiculous to those of us who learned how to read the correct way, but this is how they're teaching children to read in the schools today. And Horace Mann tried it in Boston. It was an absolute miserable failure. If you want to get an idea of how much of a failure it was, you can read uh, a letter that seven of the Boston uh, headmasters wrote about this uh, method of teaching reading. They said it's such a disaster, never try it again. It flies in the face of all logic. And so for a long time it was dead. People said, well that was stupid, let's never do that again. And um, it produces dyslexia, it produces all kinds of horrible things because it's not natural, right? It's, that's how you learn to read Chinese because in Chinese you have symbols that represent words, that represent ideas. We have a phonetic alphabet where we, our letters represent sounds, not words, right? So uh, even Dr. Seuss, uh, and actually his books promote this way of thinking. They get your brain ready to learn sight words. Uh, and he said, I think killing phonics is one of the greatest causes of illiteracy in the country. And it, was, it failed absolutely miserably until it was resurrected by this man, John Dewey. Um, some of you guys, if you know anything about education, you know John Dewey. Right? Uh, even today, if you, you know, if you talk to the National Education Association, if you go on Wikipedia, he's called the godfather or the founding father of the American public education system. Right? He kind of followed in the footsteps of Horace Mann. But we do know about, a lot more about his motivation, and his motivation was not an educated, informed, liberty-loving, God-fearing citizenry. In fact, it was the opposite. Um, so thanks to Horace Mann, he had set up this architecture of this Prussian mandatory schools all across the country. And that allowed John Dewey to come in with Rockefeller money, millions of dollars in Rockefeller money, and hijack this architecture and use it to pursue his plot. He was actually pretty open about his plot, so we, we can't even call it a conspiracy because he wasn't doing it in secret. He was writing openly about his agenda. But he said that um, we needed socialism in America, right? We needed communism. He went over to visit Lenin and the Soviet Union. And he said, wow, this is awesome stuff, right? It was collectivism. And that's what he wanted in America. But he knew that as long as we were a literate people and a Christian people, they would never be able to get away with that, right? If we knew our Bibles, if we knew how to read, they would never be able to subvert the United States and impose communism. And he actually gave us the model that he wanted to see in America. It was a novel by Edward Bellamy published in 1888 called Looking Backward. And this was a fantasy about a communist America with no private property by the year 2000. And uh, Dewey thought that was a great model. See, there you can see the novel Looking Backward. Uh, Dewey thought that was a great model that we should try it out in America, get rid of private property, get rid of religion and God and all these other things and um, socialize everything, collectivize everything, right? So that was his idea, and um, that's what he wanted to implement in the United States. So he already had this existing architecture of government schools. He just had to figure out how to take it over, right? Because they were still locally controlled. They were still providing good education. They were still teaching kids to read. They were still teaching kids the Bible, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, here's some more on his ideas. Uh, he was one of the early humanists, right? He, he, he was a, an adherent of what he called religious humanism. He was one of the signers of the first humanist manifesto. And uh, you know, just to give you guys some idea of whether this is compatible with Christianity, the very first plank of the humanist manifesto, of humanist manifesto one, that um, they said, uh, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. And so what are the first words in the Bible? In the beginning, God created, right? So right on, at the very beginning of their little document, they tell you this is not compatible with the worldview that almost all Americans at that time shared, that God created in the beginning, right? They say it wasn't created, it was self-existing, right? Uh, they said we are convinced that the time has passed for theism and deism, right? So we just get God totally out of the picture. That's silly stuff. We're religious humanists. We believe the universe is self-existing. And uh, they said the humanists are firmly convinced that we got to get rid of the profit-motivated society, right? This, this kind of rhetoric sounds like Castro, Mugabe, uh, Stalin, right? Uh, we got to have um, socialized and cooperative economic order, right? So this is right from the document that he put his signature on. This is the founding father of the American public education system. So we see his agenda very clearly. He was a humanist, and he bragged about being a humanist. Uh, he was a so-called educator, right? He wrote a lot about education. We reprinted one of his essays in the back of the book because it's so important. 
Uh, and he had a very different idea of education than what most people thought of as education back then. Back then, education was you teach kids to read, you teach them math, you teach them the Bible, some science, some history. He had a very different idea. He thought education was uh, the regulation of the process of coming to share in the social consciousness. Right? So uh, that probably sounds like quackery to a lot of us, but that's what he believed. And uh, that's how he shaped the government schools. Um, the only sure method of social reconstruction, right? So education was for social reconstruction. And uh, he actually had this idea that we were going to dumb down the students in the government schools. And uh, we quote again from his essay, The Primary Education Fetish, in, um, in the book. Here's actually the quote from it right here. Change must come gradually. To force it unduly would compromise its final success by favoring a violent reaction. Yeah, what kind of language is this? This is the language of a conspirator, right? This is the language of someone who needs to do things in the shadow. If he thought what he was doing was so good, why not do it openly? Why not tell people about it? Well, he knew that parents and teachers would flip out. You know, what, we're going to teach kids to read using this dumb method that we know doesn't work, right? What are you thinking? And so he got millions of dollars from the Rockefellers, who else? Uh, they had a, a philanthropy, so-called, called the General Education Board. They gave him millions of dollars to promote this quackery. He set up an experimental school, took over uh, the Teachers College at Columbia University, which was one of the most prestigious education colleges in the country. And uh, he trained up armies of educators to go out across the land, take over universities, take over schools of education, dumb down and brainwash all the teachers so that they would go out and dumb down and brainwash all the students. And that was his plan. That's why the Rockefellers gave him millions of dollars to try this lunacy. And um, so the, one of the central elements of his plan was this whole word method of reading that we just discussed, which was such a failure when they tried it in Boston back in the 1800s. Uh, he said, well, you know, that'll be perfect for our purposes, right? We don't want literate students because then they'll read their Bible and they won't be uh, malleable to create this communist society. He had also this idea that we need a common faith. This religious humanism should be our common faith and we should all be on the same page, get God out of the picture, get rid of private property and move toward this uh, socialist model. Um, so him and his cohorts put together uh, the Dick and Jane reading series, you know, uh, see, spot, run, right, so that the kids would memorize words rather than actually learning how to read. And some people can actually learn how to read this way, not extremely effectively, but some people can. Uh, but for a lot of people, they end up with dyslexia, they can't read anything. You know, you can memorize a certain amount of words, but there's a limit, right? You can't memorize, what is it, 80,000 words in the English language. You just can't do it. So when you come to a word you've never seen before that you've never memorized, you just have to guess, right? You use, they have context clues and you know, other nonsense. So instead of reading, they're guessing at the words. And there's very simple tests that you can use to see if your own children have been damaged by this quackery. Um, if anybody wants to know more about that, just come and talk to me or send me an email. Uh, and it's possible to undo the damage as well. My co-author, Sam Blumenfeld, he was able to cure a lot of dyslexics who had been damaged by this, who had been handicapped by this. Um, so he also um, has been exposed many times, John Dewey, right? And this whole word quackery has been exposed many times. Uh, in 1955, Rudolf Flesch put out a book, Why Johnny Can't Read, and he explained in plain English why Johnny couldn't read, because they were teaching him using quack methods in the schools that had been discredited since the mid-1800s. Um, and yet, this is still taught in schools, in government schools, all across the country. And then, uh, you know, the, the kids will go home and their parents will drill them with the flashcards, you know, what does this word say? And they're supposed to just know it by memory, rather than actually just reading it. Uh, you know, I taught a four-year-old how to read in a few months with almost no effort. And here we have kids graduating from high school. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to educate them, and they can't even read their high school diploma. You know, something is really weird here, right? Something is very fishy. How could this happen? Uh, well, the feds really cemented this into place, right? There's, there's no constitutional authority for federal involvement in education, but we have the feds in the classroom anyways, right? We have, uh, for decades now, uh, Jimmy Carter signed this uh, law to create the U.S. Department of Education, and uh, what they do is they, you know, they give a little bit of federal funding, and then they say, in exchange for this federal funding, you need to do this, 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 or this, and now we ended up with, of course, Common Core, right? Here's, here's uh, education spending versus education results. Even this chart is actually misleading, because yeah, the spending has been skyrocketing, but it's not that the results have been stable. If you use any objective measure, SATs for example, you'll see we're getting dumber and dumber and dumber. Each generation gets dumber than the last, to the point where the dumb kids in the 50s and the 60s are smarter than the smart kids today. And that's no joke. They recenter the test every 10 years to conceal the scale of this dumbing down that's happening in the United States. 
Uh, now we have Common Core, right? It's just really the next step in dumbing down. People think if we get rid of Common Core, everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. But Common Core is nevertheless a total and complete disaster. And you don't have to take my word for it. They put two experts on here. How do I get the little, um, the, oh, forget it. I was going to get the laser pointer. Oh, little red, there we go. So they put two subject matter experts on this Common Core Validation Committee. Members have described this committee to me as a rubber stamp committee. Uh, but this was the Common Core's own committee. Uh, Dr. Sandra Stotsky, I've spoken to her many times. I serve on a board with her. And uh, she, she was um, an English language expert. She was a professor of education. She actually designed Massachusetts English language arts uh, curriculum before the Common Core came along. And she said, this is crazy. I'm not going to put my name on this. This is going to dumb down the students. It's going to take out all the good literature. It's going to reduce the literacy and the critical thinking skills of the American people. There's no way I'm putting my name on that. And now she travels the country telling state legislators and everybody else what a disaster this is. And this is the people that they selected because they assumed they would just rubber stamp the thing. She's not opposed to national standards. National standards are unconstitutional. But she had this to say. Great lady. And then we have Dr. James Milgram. He was the math expert, Stanford mathematics professor. And uh, he said the math standards are unclear, they're confusing, and in some cases they're based on inaccurate math. And so, of course, we'll roll that across the whole country. Everybody can learn dumbed down, inaccurate math, uh, to the point where you know parents with math degrees, parents with accounting degrees, can't even help their own kids with the math homework. What is going on here? Total craziness. Uh, Common Core also uses the whole word approach and then they add a little bit of sprinkling of phonics in after the damage has been done so they can say, oh yeah, we use phonics, you know, don't get mad at us, we're using phonics, but that's only after they've built this harmful reflex into the minds of the children where they try to read by memorizing and guessing rather than spelling out words phonetically. So they're, uh, they're doing all this, now they're targeting Catholic schools, private schools, even homeschoolers are in the crosshairs. I don't know if you guys heard our uh, illustrious education secretary. He said he's concerned about homeschoolers, right? They're not getting the full range of educational options that all children need. And uh, by that they mean Common Core, right? <laughs> um, right. Uh, so UNESCO, uh, this is the UN Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. And uh, believe it or not, they are deeply involved in education in the United States and around the world. Uh, it was actually founded for the purpose of bringing about global government, and they were much more open about that back in the day. First Secretary General, uh, Julian Huxley, he was the brother of Aldous Huxley, maybe some of you guys know Brave New World. Uh, and he said that the goal was a political unification in some sort of world government. Uh, in 1949, they released some pamphlets. One of them said that schools need to be used to combat family attitudes. And that's you guys, right? Your kids can't have your attitudes because uh, then they might be Christian, then they might not, might not like this idea of world government. They might be attached to their country, to their family, to their God, etc. So we've got to get rid of that. We've got to use schools to combat family attitudes. Now they have all kinds of programs, uh, education for sustainable development. Uh, that should ring an alarm bell, especially after Armando's great presentation. Uh, education for world citizenship, right? Uh, they have a deal with Bill Gates, who was the primary financier of uh, Common Core. Uh, the last study I saw said he sunk two billion, with a B, of his own money into Common Core, promoting it, developing it, uh, bribing and lobbying to get it passed, etc. And, um, of course, he doesn't send his kids to a Common Core school, right? He knows better than that. He sends them to a fancy private school where they wouldn't touch Common Core with a 100-foot pole. But he wants it for the rest of us. Um, and they have training manuals, this UNESCO. Uh, if you want to be really disgusted and horrified, go check them out. They're available on UNESCO's website. I mean, they want to teach four-year-olds things that I wouldn't say in any company. Um, and you can go look at it yourself. I'm not going to talk more about it than that. Disgusting stuff. By 9 to 12 years old, the kids need to know how to promote legal and safe abortion. You know, uh, some of the perversion that they're teaching these little kids is mind-boggling. It's unbelievable. Um, they actually have a World Core curriculum, believe it or not. The name probably sounds familiar. It's very similar to Common Core. And uh, they wanted to use it in every school all over the world. They spent a lot of money and time developing it. Robert Mueller was the lead architect. He was a self-described disciple of Alice Bailey. And uh, he actually dedicated the standards to Alice Bailey. If you want a real trip down the rabbit hole, look up Alice Bailey. This is a weird woman. She was the founder of the Lucifer Publishing Company. Uh, she wrote all kinds of books, Education in the New Age. Read that if you want to be freaked out. Uh, she said that these uh, ascended masters, she called them, would take her over. Uh, you know, any Christian who reads their Bible would automatically recognize this as demons. 
Uh, but they would take her over, she would invite them in, they would, and they would use her, she said, to write these Looney Tunes books on education and the new age and externalization of the hierarchy and all this other occultist mumbo jumbo uh, crazy stuff. <laughs> so uh, look it up yourself if you want to. I highly encourage you to do that. That's what they want in every school in the world. Uh, so this world core curriculum has to teach the child to see him or herself as a part of the greater whole. So we need the collectivism. Current head of UNESCO is actually Irina Bokova, this lady right here. Uh, and she is an actual Bulgarian communist. She was a very high ranking official in the People's Republic of Bulgaria. Best estimate I saw, they murdered 222,000 people, a lot of Christians, tortured, labor camps, you know, standard communist stuff. And that's where she comes from. And then Arnie Duncan, uh, Obama's education secretary for seven years of his term. Uh, he says that UNESCO is his global partner. Right? Who wouldn't want UNESCO as a global partner with all this? To create green and global citizens. And he says education is actually a weapon to change the world. Did you know that? Education is a weapon to change the world. There you go. Um, and so that's what they're doing. They have um, a global action plan. They just came out with this in June. They were meeting in South Korea. Um, they said we need a, a UN-directed global education to promote integrated development of the whole person. And they include the formation of ethics, values, and spirituality. You want these people forming the ethics and values and spirituality of your kids? Then you're nuts. Sorry, but you are. <laughs> uh, global citizenship needs to be incorporated into curricula worldwide. And children need to understand their responsibilities to protect the planet and to promote the UN's vision of the common good. And you know, we always hear the dictators talk about the common good. We just need to execute a few more people and then we'll be at the utopia, right? They always say that. Um, Education for the future. This comes straight from UNESCO's website as well, the Education for Sustainable Development. And uh, I think after Armando's presentation, this will make more sense. But uh, here they're really telling us, more highly educated people who have higher incomes, they consume more resources than poorly educated people and uh, who have lower incomes. And in this case, that means more education increases the threat to sustainability. So <laughs> you can't have more education because then we won't be sustainable. Uh, this is what I found in Rio. Uh, I went to the United Nations uh, Rio Plus 20 conference, the UN Conference on Sustainable Development, and they had these little posters around. And uh, here you can see Earth, right? He's sick, he's got the thermometer, he looks very depressed. And uh, the doctor comes along and says, I know the problem, you have humans. So that's the problem, that's the diagnosis, right? And what do you do with the disease? Well, you try to eradicate the disease, right? And in this case, the disease is humans. They told us so. And this is totally normal at these conferences. I mean, people don't even blink at these types of things, but that is going to be always ingrained in my mind. Um, the summit was chaired by an anti-American Chinese communist, a guy named Shah Zakun. He gave an award to the general who massacred all those students at Tiananmen Square, and he oversaw this summit coming up with the sustainability junk. Um, and uh, Holdren, <laughs> Obama's science czar. Uh, Armando talked a little bit about him. He's the guy who thinks uh, forced abortions and uh, drugging the water supply with sterilizing agents to control the population is not only a good idea, but constitutional. So, you know, who else would you pick for a science czar? Uh, here's some quotes from his book. Uh, Armando got some of these. Um, population at large could be sterilized by infertility drugs put into the drinking water. <laughs> Obama's science czar. Right. His Ebola czar actually said the biggest problem facing the world is overpopulation. So uh, who else would you choose for an Ebola czar? Uh, single mothers and teen mothers should have their babies seized. People who contribute to social deterioration should not be allowed to have kids. Uh, and he called for a transnational, he called it a planetary regime, those are his words, to control resources and population and all these other things. So these guys are nuts. Um, here's Maurice Strong. He was the head of the UN Environmental Program uh, from the Club of Rome, a group of, group of globalists and communists says that uh, he, he was defining sustainability here, and this was actually at the first Earth Summit in Rio, the UN Sustainable Development Conference. The current lifestyles and consumption patterns, high meat intake, fossil fuels, right, those things that you use to power your car and to uh, get around and to grow your food, none of those things are sustainable. Uh, even AC, right, air conditioning's gotta go, suburban housing, right, we all need to be packed into these little compact cities. None of that is sustainable, says him, right? Um, then they have the UN Agenda 2030. This is a new one, and Armando touched on this as well, the post-2015 agenda. Um, some of this stuff is just unbelievable. I'll, I pulled a few quotes out of there so you can see for yourself. Goal number 10 says that um, we need to reduce inequality within and among countries. So, you know, national socialism is not enough. We need international socialism, and who else to manage it but the United Nations? 
Uh, and to do this is only going to be possible if wealth is shared and income inequality is addressed. And by wealth being shared, they mean your wealth, right? And uh, shared with not the poor people who you know actually might benefit from it. They're talking about sharing it with the dictators who made these people poor to begin with, and the United Nations. Um, by 2030, all men and women, in particular the poor, they need to have equal rights to economic resources. Right? This might as well come from you know the platform of the Communist Party or the you know Cuba or Zimbabwe. But that's what they're talking about. This is in their document. You can go to the UN's website, read Agenda 2030. I encourage you to do it. Um, we need fundamental changes in the way that our societies produce and consume goods. So how do you make fundamental changes in the way we produce and consume goods? Well, you have to have the government control the way we produce and consume goods. So that should sound familiar. Uh, we need universal health coverage, vaccines for all, universal mental health, uh, sexual and reproductive health care services. And you know, by that, they mean abortion, and they don't hide that. So abortion for everybody. Uh, lots of vaccines, lots of mental health, and um, targeting of the children, right? They're coming for your kids, and they say right in the document that they're coming for your kids. Uh, your children are actually critical agents of change. Did you know that? And uh, they're going to find in these new goals a platform to channel their capacities for activism into the creation of a better world. Uh, by 2030, the UN also wants to ensure that all learners, that means all of our children, acquire the knowledge and skills needed to promote not just enough to accept, they need to promote sustainable development, and uh, that means human rights, gender equality, blah, 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 blah. Um, so the refugee crisis, right? Uh, I'll just touch on this very briefly because we've got so much to cover. Uh, but first, these people destroyed a number of countries, right? Libya, Syria, Iraq, etc. So they bombed these countries to smithereens, ruined people's homes, ruined the infrastructure, I mean, just create a miserable condition. And then they say, hey, why don't you guys all come to Europe and the United States? We'll pay for your plane tickets, we'll give you a house, free health care, and you guys can all come. No security vetting, because that would be politically incorrect. You guys can just all come on over, right? Um, so here's just some numbers from uh, what's happening in Europe. Two million people arrived in the last year. Uh, this year, even more are supposed to be coming. More than two-thirds of the Syrians that registered in Greece and Italy were men. About three-fourths of the refugees into the European Union were men, according to the United Nations. Uh, more than 90% of the unaccompanied minors are men, and the tsunami is growing every day. So, uh, men and women, real quick, just a thought exercise here. If your family's in a war zone, what do you do? Do you say, all right, guys, I'm going to Europe. See you guys later. Bye, wife. Bye, children. Right, exactly. That's absurd, right? You would never do that if you're a proper husband, if you're a proper father. You wouldn't even consider leaving your wife and children and going somewhere else. So something is going on here, right? What is going on here? Who knows? But the UN is uh, running this all. They have the uh, UN High Commissioner of Refugees, and uh, he is the one, actually, Antonio Guterres. I just wrote about him yesterday because he is now the new Secretary General of the United Nations. He'll take office in January. Um, he was also the president of Socialist International until 2005. Uh, they openly admit that they want a global socialist government. In 2012, they had their annual Congress in an African country led by a Marxist-Leninist political party that was at that moment involved in what the leading genocide experts of the world said was preparation and planning for genocide. They were going to exterminate a vulnerable minority group. So that's where these guys go meet and uh, they come up with their declarations about we need global socialism and we need your wealth and all that other stuff. Um, Christians are almost completely excluded from these refugee programs, right? Uh, Antonio Guterres said they need to stay there, the Muslims should come, the Christians need to stay there. And um, so here in their own words is the real agenda, right? This guy, he was the chairman of Goldman Sachs, he was also on the steering committee of the Bilderberg Group, and this is what he said was the purpose of all this. The governments need to recognize sovereignty is an illusion, right? No more nations, that whole national sovereignty stuff, that is outdated. Uh, it's an absolute illusion and we need to put it behind us. Uh, he says that we got to take on some of those old shibboleths, the uh, historic memories and images of our country, right? No more countries, that's just old fashioned stuff. And then here, billionaire globalist George Soros, he says that the plan uh, treats protection of refugees as the objective and national borders as the obstacle. So we got to get rid of those pesky national borders. Uh, but who created the nations? Does anybody remember? God created the nations, right? So what do we say about people who want to abolish nations? Well, here's uh, the old Tower of Babel right here, right? This was a historic uh, art about the Tower of Babel. Here's the EU Parliament in Strasbourg. They actually admit that they modeled the Parliament on the Tower of Babel. Uh, here's an official EU poster, right? Many tongues, one voice. We'll get rid of those pesky nations and we'll just have uh, these blocks, the blockheads, right? Um, 
here's Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Uh, so they haven't fooled everybody, right? Uh, he was pretty right on the mark. He said, we're dealing with a treasonous conspiracy. Those are his words, not mine. And he said that um, this mass of people who are being uh, imported endanger our way of life, our culture, our customs, and our Christian traditions. It's a pre-planned, orchestrated operation. He said it's being led by fanatical internationalists or globalists, whatever you want to call them. And he says that the purpose here, the purpose, oops, purpose of settling all these people here is to reshape the religious and cultural landscape of Europe and to re-engineer its ethnic foundations, thereby eliminating the last barrier to internationalism or globalism, global government, and that would be the nation states. So um, that is really, in a nutshell, the agenda, right? Get rid of Christianity, get rid of nation states, and create this global system. One of the big tools they're using, and I, I know we don't have too much more time here, so I'll have to, 1245, okay. So we'll go pretty quick here. Um, they're using these free trade deals as one of the ways that they're undermining and destroying the national sovereignty, not only of the United States, but all over the world. The European Union, for example, was created out of one of these free trade deals. So um, they're being used first to destroy the U.S. economy, right? They're hollowing out our manufacturing base. At this point, we almost can't make anything, right, without help from communist China, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, Real free trade obviously doesn't require thousands of pages of regulations. That's the opposite of free, right? Free trade is just, hey, you're an American, you can trade with a Mexican, you can trade with a Canadian or anybody else that you want to. That's not what they're talking about. They're setting up international courts. They're setting up international bureaucracies with the power to overrule our state and federal Congress and uh, our courts, and this is a very big problem. So um, they've got NAFTA, right, the North American Free Trade Agreement, the TPP, the, TP, the TTIP, and uh, so let's talk about the European Union, because I think this really shows us where we're going. Um, started as a coal and steel, later it was the European Free Trade Agreement, right? That sounds a lot like the North American Free Trade Agreement, and it's not by coincidence. So they started creating these supranational institutions, right? They have the, now the European Parliament, the European Central Bank, the European Court of Justice, the European uh, Council, the European Commission, all these other things. And now the EU literally dominates the formerly sovereign nation. Something like 80 to 90% of the laws that govern Europeans today come from unelected EU bureaucracies, not national parliaments that can be replaced by voters. <coughs> the exact same thing is occurring with NAFTA. And um, there was a really interesting document that came out from WikiLeaks, from the embassy in Ottawa, and from the US embassy in Ottawa. They talked about a single currency for North America. I encourage you to go read this document because it, it boggles the mind that uh, this was going on 10 years ago. You know, and, and on TV they were saying, oh, it's just a conspiracy theory, the idea that they want to subvert national independence in the United States. It's not a theory, and it's actually not even a conspiracy anymore. They're doing it in the open, and conspiracy by definition requires secrecy. So um, that's what they're up to. Uh, NAFTA is serving as the foundation to build this North American Union. Um, WikiLeaks exposed this again in 2005. Go check out this document. It's just mind-blowing. They're talking about single currency, single parliament, abolishing the borders, creating a customs union around the United States, Mexico, and Canada, opening up the borders to free flow of people. Um, and now again, they're doing it in the open. General Petraeus, right, the disgraced the former general who was supposedly leading the terror war, but who now says we should be allies with Al-Qaeda openly. Um, he says that after America comes North America, and he gave a whole speech about this, how great it's going to be when we're just North America and we get rid of America. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations architect behind all this, a guy named Robert Pastor, uh, he did a lot of work on this. He came up with his North American community. You can read all his publications. He died not long ago, but he put out a book and he attacked the John Birch Society for ruining his little plan. He said, those darn Birchers messed up my plan. You probably didn't hear about that on the news. But uh, he acknowledged what the problem was. And um, NAFTA is, of course, not the end, right? And we'll talk about the real agenda behind all this a little bit more. Uh, they've got two big ones going on right now. Somebody mentioned the Trade and Services Agreement. That's another big one. We don't have time to get into it. But let's look at the TPP and the TTIP. Uh, the TPP includes more than 12 governments. Uh, it's got the communist dictatorship in Vietnam, the Islamic dictatorship in Brunei. All of these guys are going to have the same voting power as the United States with our 300 million people, elected government, and so on. And so it only makes sense that a tin pot dictator in Vietnam or in Brunei should have the same vote as the United States. Uh, Senator Jeff Sessions, one of the few good guys left in Congress, he said this new structure is known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership Commission, a Pacific Union which meets, appoints unelected bureaucrats, rules, and changes the agreement after the adoption. So once we join this thing, they can just change it, and Congress will have no say. So, um, you know, this is incredible. 
these, uh, these agreements, they set up um, international kangaroo tribunals where corporations can sue taxpayers. If our state government passes a law that uh, some corporation in Vietnam, you know, state-run behemoth, says, no, that's not fair, I don't like that, it's going to infringe on our profits, they can sue our state government, really our taxpayers here, to pay them money because they don't like the laws that we're approving. Now, then they have the TTIP, um, and actually it is a plan to merge the EU with the United States. They're going to harmonize the bureaucratic structure. And there's something really interesting about this. I co-wrote a book. I don't have it with me, unfortunately, but you can find it online and you can even get it for free as a PDF. But um, this was a lot more open 50, 60 years ago. They were introducing resolutions in Congress calling for us to merge with the Europeans. But they said, first, we've got to build up this European Union. And this is all extremely well documented, straight from the horse's mouth. U.S. presidents were openly pushing for this. John F. Kennedy among them. Um, and of course, the idea is that you know, once you have 50% uh, of global GDP, the EU, the EU and the US, well, everybody else has got to follow suit, obey the same regulations created by the same unaccountable bureaucrats. So um, what's the real agenda here? Well, we're moving toward this uh, global system, right? The UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, he steps down in January. He says the UN is the parliament of humanity. Those are his words, not mine. And he says it repeatedly, regularly now. So it's not just you know, something slipped out of his mouth one time. This is a calculated thing. They're preparing us for this idea that the UN is the parliament of humanity. Who's going to be our representatives in this parliament of humanity? Well, you know, uh, Robert Mugabe, the genocidal Marxist maniac, will certainly send his representative. Castro will send his. Uh, that little lunatic in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, will send his. And what about us? Well, even the establishment admits that more than 55% of the UN's member governments are unfree. Some of them are just brutal, mass-murdering dictatorship. Some of them are you know, genocidal psychopaths. But more than half, well more than half, are unfree. So if we create this parliament of humanity and uh, Kim Jong-un gets the same vote as the United States, what kind of system is that going to be? Not a pleasant one, I can assure you. Uh, the G77 plus communist China, uh, they actually 134 governments, the G77, it used to be 77. Uh, they had a meeting last year in Bolivia. They, they came out with an outcome document. It was called, For a New World Order to Live Well. That was their term. They said, uh, the UN General Assembly has to be an emblem of global sovereignty in the new world order. Um, Ban Ki-moon, we talked about Agenda 2030 a while ago. Ban Ki-moon is now running around calling this the Declaration of Interdependence for we the peoples. So we're moving to a new era where we the peoples have a declaration of interdependence. And what does that mean for the United States, for our constitution, for our liberties? Well, nothing good, right? Their 70th anniversary slogan, strong UN, better world, right? Short, sweet, right to the point, strong UN, better world, right? So let's consider this here for a minute. What we're losing and what we're replacing it with. Here's the US Declaration of Independence, right? This is kind of the guiding idea of our country. This was the purpose of establishing our country. And it says that we hold these truths to be self-evident. So this is just so obvious, you can't even deny it. It's just plain as day. It's self-evident that all men are created equal and that all of us are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. So as Armando was saying, God gave us our rights and we institute governments that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. So God gave us rights and we as free humans set up governments to protect these rights. That is the purpose of government. That is what the founders of the United States said the purpose of government was. To protect our rights. Not to give you welfare, not to educate your kids, not to fight wars, not to create trade agreements, to protect your rights. So if they're not protecting your rights, they're not doing their job. Their job is to protect your rights. That's why we founded our country in the first place. And uh, here's what the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights says. And this is kind of the replacement, right, that they want to replace our Bill of Rights and our nation. They're going to replace it with these human rights, right? Rather than God-given rights, we have these human rights. Doesn't that sound sweet? Well, first of all, they're not from God, right? There's no mention of God in any of these documents. These come from governments. These come from treaties. These come from international organizations. So, you know, governments giveth, governments can taketh away, right? Um, and actually, they say this explicitly in the document, so we don't even need to speculate. Uh, Article 29 says rights, and, you know, I use it in quotes because they're not talking about rights here, but rights can be limited by law under the guise of pretty much everything, right? They say public order, general welfare, blah, blah, blah. Rights can always be limited by law. Um, the same article, Article 29, go check this out on the UN's website. Everyone's got duties to their communities, and rights and freedoms may in no case be exercised contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. 
So, you know, we could have a First Amendment. Uh, freedom of speech shall not be infringed unless Congress gets mad or doesn't like what you're saying. It doesn't go with the principles that we agree with. So then you can't have freedom of speech anymore. And that is what they're saying openly in this document. So, you know, it, it's not a good deal, right? We're not gonna, it's not a good deal to give up our nation and our Constitution and our Bill of Rights for this fraud that they're trying to sell us. Uh, so more and more they're attacking the United States. Uh, just in the last year, I write about this every day, in the last year they've been uh, calling for, oh, well, the UN Human Rights Council, right, dominated by dictators. Cuba gets a seat there. Venezuela gets a seat there. Communist China murdered 80 million people gets a seat there. All these lunatics get a seat there. And the, Saudi Arabia, right, they chop off the heads of apostates. They don't like Christians, right? Christians get uh, not fed to the lions, but uh, certainly not pleasant treatment. Um, they say that for human rights and international law, the U.S. government and all governments need to, first of all, outlaw and punish certain forms of speech that they don't like, right? Uh, we need to impose more gun control. After that shooting in Orlando, the head of the UN human rights bureaucracy, Zaid uh, Hussein from Jordan, he's a prince in the dictatorship there, said uh, international law requires the US government to impose robust gun control. So what about our constitution that forbids more gun control, right? Um, they gotta ignore due process protections, overturn state self-defense laws, right, during the, uh, the thing about the what is it, the Stand Your Ground Law. The UN came out over and over again. You can't have that law. You can't have that law. That is against human rights, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they want to eliminate constitutional limitations on the federal government, ban spanking of children as a discipline, legalize abortion. That's already legal here, but they want it legal everywhere. They, they say UN human rights requires governments to regulate private schools so that they promote this ludicrous notion of human rights. They need to provide more welfare, right? Um, and the end goal is, uh, their term is the new world order, right? You can go on YouTube, check out George Bush talking about this. He gives you a really good description of what this new world order is. But uh, the idea is to divide up the world into these regions, the African Union, and all these exist already, the Eurasian Union, the European Union. Middle East Union actually does not exist yet, but it's in the process of being created. Uh, North American Union, Union of South American States dominated by communists, and um, create this global system, right? And so here it is in their own words. Here's Henry Kissinger. Uh, the guy who constantly blabbers about a new world order, right? The, his words, not mine. This is from his book. It came out in 2014. Just replace the word order with government and you really understand what he's talking about. The contemporary quest for world order is going to need a coherent strategy to establish a concept of order within the various regions and then relate these regional orders to one another. So that's why we see this crazy mad dash to divide the world up into regions. That's why we have an EU. That's why the US, the European Union, and Communist China are imposing an African Union on Africans. Do you think Africans woke up one day and said, hey, let's make an African Union? No, right, of course not. It, it is almost entirely financed by US taxpayers, the European Union, and the dictatorship in China. So this is a fraud, but this is the goal, right? Divide it up into these regional governments. Each of these regional governments admits that it's subservient to the United Nations. Read the Lisbon Treaty, which is the EU constitution. Read the African Union treaties that create the African Union. Read the Charter of NATO. They're all subservient to the United Nations, and they say so. Um, and here in their own words, right? I mentioned George Bush. He said the New World Order is going to be an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping or war making, take your pick, role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN founders. Who were the UN's founders? Well, Joseph Stalin was one, right? One of the worst butchers and mass murderers of human history. Who were the others? We had one, right? We had a representative there. He actually chaired the conference. His name was Alger Hiss. Anybody know anything about him? He was later convicted for being a Soviet spy and lying about it. So great people who uh, founded this United Nations, right? Why wouldn't we want a global peacekeeping force to impose their vision on us? Uh, George Soros said he thinks uh, that the New World Order, China has to be part of creating it and they have to buy into it and they have to own it in the same way that the United States owns the current order. Um, here's the book I was telling you about. If you want to see their own words about this. I didn't write anything here except the introduction. All we did was take information from the congressional record, put it in the book. You can see it in their own words. This is what they're up to. They want to create these regional governments and then move toward this global government. Uh, but we can get out of it, right? We can get out of the UN. There's already legislation in Congress for an M exit, we call it, after the Brexit, right? H.R. 1205, the American Sovereignty Restoration Act. Get us out of the United Nations, end all the dumb treaties. Um, Actually, one of my most popular articles ever was on this topic. Uh, 227,000 shares on Facebook, which is a good number. Uh, you know, a lot of the mainstream media would love to have numbers like that. Um, and we have good guys in Congress that are pushing this. It's uh, a great group of guys. Uh, almost all of them went back to re-election. 
So what are the solutions to all this? Well, you know, we've heard this a few times now. We really need to pray. And, you know, it's not just to say that. We really need to, right? Uh, God actually promises us in the Bible, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So that's a promise from God. If we do those things, he will heal our land. And uh, Armando had Psalm 2, right? God laughs at these people. These people are a joke. These people are totally powerless. And the American people can stop them with the help of God and with the help of education. So we need to share the good news. Get active in your church. Make sure God is not driven out of the public square. Educate yourself and educate others. To educate others, first you need to educate yourself, right? Obviously. Get some books, right? They hide all the secrets in the library. It's not a joke. That's where they hide the secrets. So go to the library. Um, Read your Bible, read your Constitution, read your Declaration of Independence, study economics, theology, politics, philosophy, history, science. You need to know all these things to be a well-rounded individual and to be able to educate others. Uh, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, right? We need knowledge, we need to educate ourselves so that we can educate others and fix these problems. Uh, educate your kids, protect them from this dumbing down that I talked about earlier on. Uh, it's serious stuff, you know, do not feed your children into this system. Find something else, homeschool them. Find a good Christian school. Find a good co-op. There's lots of options available. We live in a free country. Do not voluntarily surrender your children to be indoctrinated. Uh, educate others. You know, Each person here has a big circle of influence. Each person out here can influence 10, 20, 50, 100 people, maybe more. Some of you, thousands. Go do it, right? Um, don't be misled by people who say, oh, it's the Jews, or oh, it's the Catholics, or you know, it's none of that stuff. That is pointless. It's divisive. It doesn't accomplish anything. It takes us off the real track that we need to be worried about, right? Uh, subscribe to the New American Magazine. I have some free copies in the back. You know, if you want to get one, uh, I'd be happy to give you until they run out. It's really an awesome magazine. That's why I started writing for it. I was like in journalism school. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm wasting my time here. What am I possibly going to do with this degree? The media is controlled. The media is ridiculous. Then I found this magazine and said, there we go. That's what I'm going to do. It's a great magazine. Read it for a few months and you will be more educated than 99 out of 100 people in this country, and you will be in a position to help others. Um, for those who doubt it, here's Rockefeller. This is his own words, right? Don't buy his book, he's got plenty of money already. But in his memoirs, you go to the library, right? Library, here it is again. Uh, this is what he says. Some believe that we, his family, uh, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family as me as internationalist, conspiring, right, that's his word, with others to build a one world system. If that's the charge, he stands guilty and he's proud. So he's admitting to being a conspirator, working with a cabal of other people against the best interests of his country. He's admitting it. Don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. And that's it. God bless America. Thanks, guys.